Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to be a little bit different. I'm going to fly through a ton of slides in my few minutes that I have to paint a picture of something that I think is very important for us to see that's somewhat related to everything you've seen so far. And I believe that the only constant is change. The only variable is the rate of change. And I like to think that I was the one that came up with it, but I'm not. This sleepy old guy there said it over 2,500 years ago. A, a very famous ancient Greek philosopher that was central to his thesis on the doctrine of the world, that change was so important. So much so important that you can't step twice into the same river for another, other waters are ever flowing onto you. Everything flows, nothing stands still. And if you think about the economy, and if you think about the history of the world, whatever dimension of it, you think this is uh, something that continues to be true. And in my few minutes, I would like you to think about these things in terms of how it affects you and your life and the other things that you're going to see with respect to technology. So one simple picture, one simple technology, a tire. It's on the right-hand side, modern tire, 2000. There's tires that look a little bit more modern than that. And the picture's going back to drawings of them 2500 BC, so 4500 years ago. The evolution of technology has taken different times and different places. And if I could focus in on the third graph, the wheel, the bicycle. That bicycle was around the time around 1880, Civil War period a little bit later. But just after that period of time, in 1890s, there was the first bicycle, the two wheels were of the same size. The bicycle that most of us know today, of course it's a little bit different. But that bicycle on the back of this 1892 magazine on pictures of the Civil War was for sale in New York City for $90. The buggy was for sale for $75. So not only does technology change, but relative prices change. Very important thing to keep in mind. So fast changing world, of course, a little bit more US centric. Just thinking about the United States in terms of the early pioneers, Civil War today the technologies that weren't there and how they evolved and how society evolved. Another type of a thought process, in 1800, the US was basically one half of 1% of the world's population. In 2010, it's roughly 5%. So we're you know, a lot bigger country relative to the world clearly because of how we grew. Jobs are changing. We all know that we started on the land, agriculture, and over time, as the Industrial Revolution and the progression, we went into manufacturing. And we know for those of us my age bracket, a little bit older, maybe some younger, we moved into services big time. But it seems as though now we're basically pushing the information age. The major driver is information, so a subcomponent of what we would call services that's also related to manufacturing. So a few charts, not too many number charts, but to give you a sense. So on the left-hand side, top to bottom, the number of people that worked on farms. In 1929, roughly 12 million in the US. Today, roughly 2 million. But we have a lot of food. And you can see the production going up from the bottom left to the top right. Production, so the productivity has been tremendous so that we need a lot fewer workers to make a lot more food. And food, in terms of production, is an incredible thing. At the same time, if I could move this thing, manufacturing. Manufacturing has grown pretty much along the way. This starts even earlier with the Industrial Revolution. But you can see employment didn't follow the same path. You can see the problem in the Depression, and then World War II, the big jump up. And fun fundamentally, a relatively flat, bouncing rate of growth between the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and then starts to decline as the output's gone up. The big question is in the last few years, since 2001, there's been a decline in manufacturing. Is that related to the then recession and now the continuing bigger recession? Or is it related to something else that's going on in the world? So the world economic order is definitely changing. Look at the relative position of uh, income per capita adjusted for prices, so real income, in China, in India, in the US going back to 1800. Fundamentally, not very much different in 1800. Of course, these are the best numbers you can get, how accurate they were at that time. You know, we don't, who only knows? But you can see that basically China and India's relative income growth did not change in real terms for a couple of hundred years. The US's started to grow 
in the 1800s and it took off after the depression and then the war and what we've seen in the growth in the United States. But that last few years, the last 20 or 30 years in China and in India have been phenomenal. The rate of growth is changing the dynamic and I can tell that a big part of this is the information flow, the information world. Flipping back, another change, geography. So one of the things we looked at is the wheelbarrow. When did they first date the wheelbarrow in China? You can see it's 200 AD, maybe it's 100 something or 200, but ball, ballpark, 200 AD. The same concept in Europe was 1200 AD. Why did it take so long? Where was the communication? Well, it took a long time to get from one place to the other. People didn't know about it. So now we see things in fundamentally in an instantaneous way wherever it is in the world. The, one of the last speakers talked about patents. Patents relative to the production of knowledge has changed. So we look in the 1880s and you can see uh, for a number of countries relatively flat rate of growth. Not a lot of growth in the 80s, the 90s, the early part of the, the, you know, the 20th century. But you can see starting in the mid 60s and later some acceleration in the rate of growth of patents and all of a sudden it's not, not only Japan is doing so well and the US finally crosses them in the last year or two, but that China is starting to accelerate at a very fast rate of growth. So you have a population that's much larger with a relatively roaring kind of production of the patent applications and other countries are starting to come up. So the only constant is change, the only variable is the rate of change and to pro project what this change is going to be like would be a heck of a thing to do. So, so much that sometimes we feel like change passes us by. Do you feel like that rock? If you do, get rid of that feeling and start getting used to change. Start thinking the world is changing at a fast rate. It's not going to be the same. It can't be the same. So try to absorb like a, a good tree absorbs the nutrients rather than the rock. So the way that we educate has clearly changed. For people my age bracket or older, we didn't have laptop computers, right? We went to the library. How many people in the audience go to the library like more than once a week? Wow, fantastic, right? That's great. But the old days, we always had to go to the library, look up the materials. We, could, we didn't have all those books in one place other than the library. Now it's on the internet. So the younger people can learn at a much different rate, in a much different way. And innovations, the things that are coming to the market, come to the market in a much different way. They are accepted much more quickly. So a telephone, when it came out in the late 1800s, it took 35 years before a quarter of the people had access to the, had, had owned the telephone. But the cell phone that came out in the 1970s, it was only 13 years before a quarter of the people had the cell phone. And the iPod took five years. So change is accelerating in the marketplace. Let's flip back to what we're talking about, computers, the computer revolution that's changed a lot of how we do things. That first computer back in 1946 that took up a room or two rooms with vacuum tubes that had the equivalent of 18,000 transistors only companies or countries could own one of those. In the 1980s, not too many years later, not too many years ago, we had personal computers with 134 transistors, almost 10 times as, as many transistors as that big old behemoth that cost a fortune. And then 2007, as one of the uh, former presenters talked about the iPhone, over 100 million transistors, and that was the first in 2007. And we know that we have chips today with two billion transistors. So the rate of growth of information, the ability to provide information, to move information is changing at a very, very fast rate. In a single lifetime, computers have transformed society. Another slide about computers. On the right, there's the picture basically talking about the supercomputer that we have at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. What that computer can do in 24 hours would take almost every man, woman, and child on the earth doing one calculation a second, every second of every minute of every hour of every day for 81 years. So if you go back to something called Moore's Law and you double that ability every year and a half or two years, so that means in a couple of years it's going to take a half a day, a quarter of a day, whatever. <laughs> so the ability to synthesize the information, tremendous capabilities that we have, and we're going to continue to grow that. So we're learning how to navigate through change. That's the good looking version of me. <laughs> but remember, the only constant is change. Nanotechnology will drive 
future change. So what, in what areas? You name it. Semiconductors has been driving it for a long time. Materials, because, of the, because it's a nanoscale, the properties are different. We're fi figuring out new ways to basically put things together and make them cheaper, lighter, faster. Uh, you know, in healthcare and pharmaceuticals, tremendous opportunities basically to go inside the body, and I'll show you some other slides, because I'm looking at my time, I better speed up. Uh, the bridge on the left side, the Brooklyn Bridge, New York City, my favorite bridge. Built like a traditional bridge. Very difficult to bridge, build. But why couldn't we build it with natural organic materials? Why couldn't we use biomimicry, basically like spiders do a web, and with, our, with na carbon nanotubes, with stuff that's much stronger than steel, much stronger than brick, much lighter? That's what we're looking at doing in the future, folks. We're changing the way we think about things by mimicking biology and learning about nanotechnology, trying to mix them together. On this picture, the uh, self-driven hybrid car, the, the Google car, you know, some years down the road, we'll have a car that's out there commercially available that you don't even have to drive. They've been testing it in California for some time. Fantastic with technology. But why not have a naturally powered car where there's no carbon footprint fundamentally for that car at the same time to give us independence? How about technologies related to, okay, healthcare, the x-rays, 1895. But now we're talking about 3D composite MRIs. So you can look specifically what the problem is. It's, it's moving from kind of like we know about it, maybe, and this is generally what it is, to becoming more precise in terms of how we deal with healthcare in the body. The last picture, chemotherapy. For those of us that have had family members over the years that have been affected, there's been tremendous changes, but we still haven't gotten to the point where we're using nanoparticles to just basically target the specific bad cell and do no other harm. So improvements in prevention and treatment of these diseases is fundamentally changing how we live and it'll have profound effects on society and we're seeing it clearly with the uh, life expectancy of society. So me, changing me, but this is maybe me. Maybe I've got to be such a nice guy or a nice person. Maybe I need a little bit tougher skin because to navigate the waters through change is going to be harder to do. We need to be thinking about how do we think about continually changing and maybe not getting comfortable except in the fact that change is a good thing and we can help people with it. So what do we need our future individuals? What skill sets? We need them to be able to handle information because there's a lot of information that's got to be put together to figure these things out. Think about DNA, right? We should know about all of our own DNA, but with that knowledge, how things could be configured to basically make people healthier. We need people that can ask the right questions because the data by itself is only good enough if we know how to configure it or how to apply it. And then we need people that can innovate, that can take those disparate ideas with that information and from those questions, that can then create the, let's say, product or process or whatever it is that's gonna help people in society or help companies, depending upon what your particular need is. Just a couple of minutes on the college, the nanoscale science and engineering where I teach, relatively new place, created focused on nanotechnology, nanoscience, nanoengineering, nanobio, nanoeconomics, to bring the disciplines together to accelerate change around nanotechnology, collaborations with other faculty members, but a lot of business, where innovation takes place, the education model is different, to focus in on economic growth, and nanoeconomics, my pitch is fundamentally, why nanoeconomics? because you need economics to accelerate change. Science and engineering by themselves, if there's no market for it, if there's no funding for it, it is not gonna go as far as if you can put those together. So to put those together can hopefully help us to grow at a faster rate. So we educate for future jobs. We have one common goal, to accelerate positive change. But most importantly, what do we need? We need to form individuals that embrace change. We need to talk to our younger people, our older people, to embrace the change and look at it as a good thing and have more conversations about it because that's how we're going to compete in the 21st century. And finally, future generations will need to be turbocharged. We need them to feel like, wow, it's a really great thing and you need to think about things, these are all of these different dimensions because if they really believe that the only constant is change, and I have, if, you doubt it, we'll talk some more about some of those numbers that I've showed you. There's a lot of dimensions of change at the same time. 
The only way we can deal with it is to take this mantra, get more people thinking about it in groups, and feel not turbocharged like we can't rest. We need the rest, we need the play, but we need to think about things in different ways and accept those changes. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.